Hello friends, this teaching video is on the subject of election, which we see in the Bible, and it's been debated in the body of Christ uh, quite a bit. If you do any research on this subject, you'll see that the debate is pretty intense, and there are reasons for it. Uh, perspective is the reason why there's a ongoing debate. Perspective is so important what your perspective is of certain scriptures, what they mean and what God intended, is all the difference in the world between what right and wrong. And uh, before I get into it, I want to mention that, that I had uh, written this book called Biblical Perspectives, A Guide to the True Grace of God, Volume 1. I wrote this a while ago, and w what I did in this book is that I took scriptures and then gave my, it's just a book of scriptures, and I gave my perspective on each one of the scriptures that I mentioned, that I wrote down here, uh, because perspective, I'm giving you my perspective. And the reason why I'm doing that with this video, I'm gonna put up, and I'll put a picture up on the screen now of that also. So and then at the, in the, on the YouTube video, a link to how you get it. It's, it's very inexpensive, because I don't, make any profit on it. I set it at a price where I don't make no, no profit. So, uh, and before I go any further, the reason why I'm doing this, another reason why I'm doing this is because, and I'm not, I'm not saying that I am right about everything, that I have all the answers, because I don't. Nobody does. We're all, the Bible even itself even says we all know in part and we prophesy in part. And we're not, we don't know fully until that day until uh, the redemption of our bodies, we get a new body, and then that's it for this age, and then we know fully. So until then, we're learning, and this, you know, the debates go on, as long as the debate is friendly, I guess. Uh, I, don't, I don't put up with people that are obnoxious and nasty and rude and curse me out. I just delete those comments on my YouTube channel, so I just won't put up with it. Uh, now, and so I'm doing this video because a, a lot of people want to know what my perspective is on it. And, and so, like, if, if you find as if this ministry has helped you, it's been effective at, at helping you to understand your identity in Christ more and to walk in the power of God that's in each of us, because that's true. When you have the Holy Spirit in you, you have the power of God in you. So everywhere you go, God goes, and the power of God goes with you everywhere, and he will use you any way he chooses and a lot of that is based on your desire, what you feel God has put in you and the desire you have to operate in the power of God. There are many gifts. And so that's one of the reasons why I'm making a video, because you want to know my perspective. And, and it's important that we know the Word of God in its entirety. I'm still, I've been born again, a born again Christian for over 24 years, and I'm still studying the Word of God. It never ends because it's a living book. You're not supposed to ever put it down. You're supposed to continually study it. And uh, to, to keep learning, because the, especially in the day that we're living in now, in these last days where the devil is pulling out all the stops and he's, tr he's trying to blast us from every direction with nonsense, with lies. And so if we take all those lies in, there's, it's, it, it pushes out the truth. We, we have to put the truth in us, push out the lies, so that no matter what situation we're in in life, the Holy Spirit can bring to our remembrance the Word of God that's in us, and it's not cluttered by all sorts of secular carnal stuff that we put in there willingly ourselves because of just being complacent. And I'm guilty of it too. I've, I've watched plenty of stuff. I don't, I don't make a habit of it, but I've watched enough stuff that's not necessarily uh, edifying. You know, not not terrible stuff, obviously, but you know, secular movies that are maybe not too too carnal or whatever. Uh, sex scenes, we just, we will, Ahava and I will turn the movie off if there's a sex, we didn't know there was a sex scene, we just turn it off, whatever, and uh, if somebody's using the Lord's name in vain, we just turn the movie off because we didn't know what was going to happen, so stuff like that, so like you just, you should be aware of what you're taking in, so, and, I, and I'm dedicating this video to my brilliant nephew, Nicholas, because he's, he's 14 years old, and he's, he has a strong faith in the Lord, and he's very intelligent. He studies the Word of God, and he, he asks me questions that are so uh, provocative and, and intelligent. 
questions that I don't, to be honest with you, I don't get too many other people. I get people asking me questions all the time. People ask me for prayer every single day. There's not a day that doesn't go by where I don't get an email or whatever uh, asking me for prayer or question of this some sort. And, but my nephew Nicholas said, he's, he asked me a lot, and, and uh, he, he said to me, he suggested, well, you should make a video on election. And I actually, I thought it was a great idea, but I put it off for a while because I know it's not an easy subject. <laughs> it's like any subject that you're going to teach on, you've got to study it. Even though I've been a born again Christian for so long, studying the Word of God, you've got to refresh your memory. You've got to get into the Word and study it. Look at the different, uh, what th people are saying about it, and the scriptures, find the scriptures that, that support what you believe about it. And... Uh, and, and so, like, you've got to do is that studying. So I put it off, and then somebody else said to me, you should do a video on election. I was like, oh, that's it. And I've got a second person now asking me this besides my nephew. So here we are. And so now election is, uh, it is tied in with uh, Calvinism. John Calvin, he adopted uh, ideas about the Word of God from a man named Augustine, who lived long before him, and uh, Calvin is pretty much the one who made this doctrine of election the way he sees it very popular. It and uh, and so like th there's there's all in fact there's a lot of people that will debate the difference between Calvinism and Arminianism, and I'm not going to get into Arminianism because uh, I don't need to. I'm just gonna I'm gonna just talk about scriptures that I believe uh, challenge Calvinistic thinking. Because uh, I'm not a Calvinist, although I do believe somewhat in all the points that they make, to an extent, it, a perspective. So that's, you know, and again, it comes back down to perspective. What's your perspective on what the scripture says? And so if you go online, you'll notice, and I'm going to put, I'm going to put these scriptures up on the screen as I'm reading them. I'll put them up on the screen. You can read them uh, right on the screen with me. And, uh, and if you go online, you'll notice that, that this right here, the doctrine of grace, the five points, the five doctrines of grace are a popular uh, popular thing that we see online that, that is what Calvin supports and, uh, and propagates about uh, the doctrines of grace, so to speak. There are five of them, and they're, they're, uh, each one of them has, uh, and I'll put that up on the screen right now, one of them has a the first letter of of each doctrine, uh, when you add them up, they, they come out to the word tulip, and that's why there's a tulip right there in the picture. And uh, so I want you to uh, take all five of these in closely, because I'm going to challenge all five of these with three scripture verses from each one. you got total depravity, and I'm going to also uh, give a brief description of what uh, Calvinists believe about each one of these. So you got total depravity unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and the perseverance of the saints. Now, uh, a Calvinist is somebody who, who believes all of these doctrines of grace. And like, for instance, total depravity, what they're saying is, now I believe, in, in a certain sense, I believe in total depravity in this sense of the word, that, that there's nothing I can do to get the sin out of my life. I'm born with a sin nature in me from my father, Adam, because when God made Adam, this is what I believe, when God made, and I believe the Bible supports this, when God made Adam, he put everybody inside of Adam, and we come out of Adam. Adam had kids, and they had kids, and they had kids, so we all come out of Adam. And so when Adam sinned, Adam and Eve sinned, uh, sin, the sin nature is in each one of us that we're born with. And uh, I think it's pretty clear to people that are honest with themselves, it's a sin nature. You take take two little babies and you put them on the floor and give them one toy, within a very short amount of time, they'll be fighting over that one toy. You don't have to teach them selfishness. And so, uh, total depravity, I believe in that in a sense that, yes, there's nothing I can do to get the sin out of my life. Uh, and so, like, I need God. It's all God. The work of salvation is from the Lord. All right, and so, uh, but I'm going to show you three scriptures that challenge the Calvinist perspective on what total depravity means. Uh, they, you know, total depravity, like I said, and they, that's what they believe. They, there's nothing you can do, and there's, and there's, 
there's there's absolutely zero effort you can put into changing yourself that there's there's no such thing as co-laboring with god none of that stuff and uh all right so the next one is unconditional election unconditional election and that's the name of this uh election is the name of this video uh, unconditional election means that that what Calvinists believe is that God has elected certain people to be saved and others he hasn't, which there's only one other thing that means. It means they go to hell, that you're not, you know, if you're not unconditionally, you're unconditionally elected. A Christian is unconditionally elected and regardless of, of what you do in your life, past, past what you've done, and, and I agree, unconditional election, it doesn't make a difference what you've done in the past, uh, it, but unconditional election in the terms in the eyes of a Calvinist is like regardless of what you do in the future in, in how you accept Christ or whether you don't or not you're going to get saved you're elected unconditionally there's nothing that's going to stop that from happening from you being saved and I'm going to show three scriptures that challenge that idea in fact that uh, I'm going to show scripture, scriptures that even challenge the idea that election means you're saved I'm going to show that election doesn't even necessarily mean you're saved uh, the third doctrine of grace in the eyes of a Calvinist is limited atonement. And, and that means that uh, uh, it's it basically, it's very similar to unconditional election. Limited atonement is God only saves a certain amount of people. The rest he is, forget it. You got no hope. Uh, the, the fourth one, the fourth doctrine of grace is irresistible grace, which means you can't resist the grace of God. Calvinists believe there's nothing you can do to resist God from saving you. His grace is sufficient, and that's true. God, Jesus' grace is sufficient. He even said it to Paul. Paul was given a thorn in the flesh, and he wanted it taken away. He asked the Lord three times to take it away, and Jesus said, My grace is sufficient for you. So uh, he had to suffer with it. And so irresistible grace, there's, there's nothing you can do to stop the grace of God. You can't, you can't challenge, you can't refute, you can't put a wall up against the grace of God. That's what they're saying. And then last, lastly, the perseverance of the saints, meaning that you're going to make it to the end. Once you're saved, you are definitely going to make it to the end. There's no falling away. That's the way it is. That's the doctrines of grace, the five doctrines of grace that a Calvinist believes in terms of election. And that's, a, I think election is a broad word that, that categorizes, that, that, that uh, all of these doctrines can fall into, and so uh, so that's it. And and uh, so I gotta put it up on the screen again. And now, uh, so the first one, total depravity. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, I have three scriptures, and so the first one is John seven verse seventeen. I'll put that up on the screen right now as I'm reading along with you guys. John seven seventeen. Anyone who chooses to do the will of God will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. Okay, so again, the first doctrine of grace, total depravity. Okay, and so that means that uh, you're, you're lost. There's, there's, you're, there's nothing good in you whatsoever. This is what a Calvinist thinks. There's nothing good in you whatsoever. You've got no strength on your own. There's no conscience, whatever that helps you to, to make a choice, no free will, none of that stuff. But John 7, 17 is saying that right there, where Jesus is saying, anyone who chooses to do the will of God, it's your choice, anyone who chooses, so it's up to you if you choose to do the will of God. Okay, so that's one scripture verse that supports that. And then you got, this, the next one is Luke 13, 24. I'll put that up on the screen. Luke 13, 24, make every effort to enter through the narrow door because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. All right, so make every effort. There you go again. That's, that's, that opposes this doctrine of total depravity. If you are totally depraved, why would Jesus tell you to make every, en every effort to enter through the narrow door? He's giving you a responsibility, telling you to make every effort. Okay, now the third scripture that I have that challenges this first doctrine of grace and total depravity is Romans 11.4. And Romans 11.4 reads, In what was God's answer to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. And now this is a situation where Elijah was fleeing 
uh, from from Jezebel who wanted to kill him and he was just getting discouraged and he didn't want any more of it. He wanted to go home to heaven. And so he's he's uh, telling God, look, they've killed all your prophets, thrown down the altars, and now they're trying to kill me. And there's nobody left. I'm the only one left. And God answered him and said, no. And, and I have reserved for myself 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to bow. And so the point I want to make about this is, is that uh, he, the Lord... This, that is certainly grace, right? The Lord has reserved 7,000 for himself. But, but what is it contingent upon? It, it says, those who have not bowed the knee to bow. If if the, if you were totally depraved, wouldn't wouldn't God, if, if you were totally depraved the way a, a Calvinist sees it, wouldn't God have just said, I have reserved for myself 7,000? That's it? But no, he goes on to say, who have not bowed the knee to bow. And so there's a reason why God has reserved. And this, it goes back to, uh, it, it touches on predestination. Like God, God predestined you to believe because he, knew, he knows everything before it happens. And I do believe that God sees the end from the beginning. The Bible supports it. He sees the end from the beginning. So he knows everything that's going to happen throughout life. And so a lot of people will say, that means you don't have a free will. Now, I don't believe that. He, it, it doesn't say that. It just means he sees everything that's going to happen. He knows what's going to happen, and he gives you a free will, and you choose. And he knows what you're going to cho choose, and so he knows who's going to love him. It comes down to who's going to love him, really. And, uh, and so, and, and so uh, not bowing the knee to Baal. Some people would say that that's uh, works. It's like, hey, wait a minute. I thought we're not saved by works, but by grace. So if I, have to, if I have to resist the enemy, isn't that me trying to get saved? It's like, well, apparently not. Uh, uh, works, a works gospel would be me doing this, that, and the other thing to try and win God's approval. Like, okay, I've done this, and Lord, now I'm justified in your sight. Uh, and so that's a works doctrine where you're trying to be, uh, you're trying to gain entrance into heaven by your own strength. But it's that's different from you uh, because you understand and know that God is a loving God, that you resist the enemy. You see that the enemy is wrong. You see he's a liar. And so you resist him. You don't bow the knee to him. And uh, so God sees that. And that's, he reserves people like that. It says it right there. Like God said to Elijah. So, okay. The next scripture. And uh, let me see. How, was how many was that? Is that that's all for total depravity? I believe, right? Let me see. Uh, yeah, I think that's all for total depravity. Let me put them down there. And uh, so the next one is unconditional election. So I have three scriptures that challenge this this doctrine, Calvinistic doctrine of unconditional election. In and perspective, of course, perspective, I say this word a lot, perspective matters, and it does, because unconditional election, it certainly sounds right, it sounds good, God unconditionally elects me, there's nothing I can do to gain my salvation, I believe that, but there's a certain perspective about unconditional election that I see in the Bible that, that challenges what the Calvinist believes. And so the first scripture is found in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. All right. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, that's pretty clear, right? Make, he's saying make every effort to confirm your calling and election. It, so it, it shows, and, and then if you do these things, if you do these things, you will never stumble, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior. It's very self-evident. It's very clear as to what that scripture is saying. That it's, it's showing that election is not even the same thing as salvation. And it's showing that you have an effort on your part. So unconditional election? Well, I don't know about that. It, it, election is conditional upon what Peter is saying here, right? Okay, so that, that's one scripture refuting that. And then we have... 2 Timothy 2.10, which reads, Therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect, 
that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. That's Paul talking, and again, it's very clear. He endures everything for the sake of the elect, that they too may obtain the salvation. So this is clearly saying that election is not even the same thing as salvation. Two different things. All right? And, and uh, yeah, so it's very clear. Okay, now the third scripture that refutes or challenges unconditional election would be found in Romans, Romans 11, 28 to 30. And it reads, As far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies for your sake. But as far as election is concerned, they are loved on account of the patriarchs. For God's gifts and his calling are irrevocable. Just as you, who were at one time disobedient to God, have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience, so they too have now become disobedient in order that they too may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. For God has bound everyone over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on them all. Do you see what is being said there? It's clearly saying, to me it is, from the perspective I believe, is that it's not even election that is getting you into heaven. It's the mercy of God. It's like, yes, they're loved. The, the elect are loved. And, you know, an election is really, a, it's really an Old Testament thought, idea, principle, uh, belief from God. It, we see this beginning, in, and the book is a Jewish book. The Bible is a Jewish book. And we see it starting in, in the Old Testament, where, uh, I forget the scripture where it is, but, it's, but it says before any, either, what Jacob and Esau, before either one of them did anything right or wrong, so that God's uh, choice in election might stand, blah, 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 goes on to say, so, like, election is found uh, back with, in the time of Jacob and Esau, possibly even further, I guess, if I study it on. Uh, so, but we don't, but we see here that, you know that Paul is saying that it's not it's the mercy of God that gets you saved not election okay so now that's three for that now the third doctrine of grace excuse me as a Calvinist believes is called limited atonement and th there are so many scriptures that challenge this and and I had a lot of scriptures a lot more scriptures for all of this challenge so to speak uh, but I wanted to conserve time, and so I just used three for each one. And it's interesting because the word also says, let every matter be established by the witness, by two or three witnesses. And so I think it's pretty clear that you can also challenge any matter with two or three witnesses. And, and so the scriptures that I presented uh, are from, they're from, from at least two writers. Each, each category is from two writers. It's three scripture verses, or more than three scripture verses, because some of these are two verses. Uh, so I'm even like, uh, I'm going according to what the Word of God teaches, even with how I'm challenging this. So, okay, so the third, again, getting back to this, a limited atonement. So, so the first verse, verse scripture verses, rather, that challenge limited atonement in, in the way a Calvinist sees it. And again, a Calvinist uh, believes limited atonement that there, you know, Jesus' atonement on the cross, his death, burial, and resurrection was for uh, to take the sin of a certain amount of people and atone for a certain amount of people, and uh, the others forget about it. Which is really, it's if you really think about it, it's it's that's it's terrible. And uh, let me explain why. So Romans three twenty four twenty two to twenty four. The righteousness. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no distinction between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. And so you see very clearly there that, that everybody, there's no difference between Jew and Gentile, everybody is freely justified by believing in the redemption that Jesus wrought on the cross. It's not a limited atonement. It's it's for everyone. Okay, so now second scripture for this. But this I'm dropping these on the floor so I don't so I don't get mixed up with them. Uh, second scripture that challenges limited atonement in the way Calvinist sees it is John three, 
16 and 17. He's, this is John 3 16 is a famous scripture verse in the Bible and I go on to add verse 17 with this for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him and so it's for everyone so whoever believes it's not just for a certain people it's not a limited atonement it's for whoever he loves the whole world God loves the whole world every human being is made in the image of God now, I'm not going to get into uh, hybrids even though I believe in the hybrid thing that's going on in the Nephilim because the Nephilim the whole subject of the Nephilim is all right there in the Bible and it's really uh, clearly taught in the book of Enoch which I love the book of Enoch I believe it's it it used to be in the canon of scripture and was removed and I don't think it should have been, but uh, but it clearly goes on. That that teaches all about the hybrids and all, and and I believe that that's going to be happening at the end. So not everybody walking around is necessarily fully human. Uh, so you might many of you just may not agree with that, but that's all right. Uh, I can I can do a, a video on that also in the future. But it says God loves the whole world. All right, so that's it's not just for a few. All right, so that's the first, that's the second scripture challenging limited atonement. And uh, the third one is 1 John 2, 2. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now that clears it, all, it up, because a lot of Calvinists will say, when God talks about the whole world, like in the previous scripture I was mentioning, that uh, the whole world, they, the Calvinists will say, to support their their doctrine, they'll say the whole world means the whole world of the predestined believers that God has chosen. <laughs> it's like really reaching if you ask me. Uh, but this clears it up. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. So our sins. So that's John talking about ours. He's talking in the in relationship to who he's speaking to. He's speaking to believers. So he's saying he Jesus is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours. But but also for the sins of the whole world. So he's now incorporating those who are not even believing yet. So he Jesus atoned for everyone. He took the sin of the whole world. And and another scripture is uh, a well known one that John the Baptist said, "Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the whole world." So I just I just cheated there. I just mentioned four scriptures <laughs> challenging that doctrine of uh, limited atonement. Now the fourth doctrine of grace in the eyes of a Calvinist, is irresistible grace. Can we resist the grace of God? And they say, no, there's no chance. Okay, well then, how do you, what do you do with Hebrews 6, 4 to 6? It says, it is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age, and who have fallen away to be brought back to repentance. Well, to me, that sounds very clearly that somebody who has fallen away has resisted, it was resisted the grace of God. He's, he's experienced it fully. And this, this scripture, these scripture verses can also fit into the category of the last doctrine of grace of perseverance of the saints. Again, but I chose to put it in irresistible grace. Because it, this is somebody, this, these scriptures are showing that somebody that has clearly experienced it all, and he's turning away. It's like, that's really stupid, but it's in there because it happens. What, why, if, if it doesn't happen, why would God put those scriptures in the Bible? And, and why would the writer of Hebrews write all that? And it was Hebrews, right? Yeah, why would the writer of Hebrews write all that if it, if it wasn't, if it didn't happen with people? It's like these things all happen. That's the reason why they're in Scripture. They're not. It's not speculation or something that could happen that's not going to happen, but it's something that happens. That's why it's in there. Now, the second Scripture that supports, that challenges, rather, the, the irresistible grace in the eyes of a Calvinist is Romans 121. Yeah, for although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him, but their thinking became futile, and their, fu and their foolish hearts were darkened. So, they're very clear, right? They knew God, although they knew God. They neither glorified Him as God, 
nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. So that doesn't sound like grace is irresistible, that you can't challenge it or refuse it or, or put a wall up to it. It's, so I don't know how they, I don't know what they do with that scripture. Uh, the third scripture now that challenges this is Luke 13, 34. What Jesus is saying, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed, you who killed the prophets and stoned those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. <clears throat> so right there, it's Jesus saying that he is often, he was, and Jesus is the grace of God, so he often tried to gather them, so he's often pouring out the grace of God upon the Jewish people as he was walking through Israel in his ministry. and But they resisted, they were not willing so they had a free will. God gave, God gives people a free will. It's like it, you can you can say no to it, and that's clearly what they did back then. And you know, and just did Jesus uh, Jesus still forgives, but you have to receive. Jesus, when he was hanging on the cross, he said, "Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do." The people that were killing him. Uh, but does that mean that they're saved? No, it doesn't, because you have to receive forgiveness by faith. You have to receive it. So Jesus was saying, "Forgive this sin." And, and But you still have to receive it by faith. Repent of thinking that you can make it on your own. Repent, you know, repentance means that you change your mind and, and you decide that I am not capable of being saved on my own strength. And it also, and it also goes further it, it, to the point where it'll change your behavior. So, because if you change your mind, it's going to change your behavior. And so you're going to turn away from practicing sin. You're still going to stumble in sin. The Bible says there is a sin that leads to death, and there is a sin that doesn't lead to death. So I believe that that scripture refers to the sin that leads to death is when you're rejecting Christ and you're continuing on in your sins, and that's a sin that leads to death. And the sin that doesn't lead to death is when is when you've accepted Christ and you're stumbling your way there, and you and the blood it's not you're not sinning on purpose, and the blood and that's the sin that the blood of Christ is constantly cleansing you of. So, anyway, that was a little side note, but it was, it's, a, it's a good one. <laughs> and now the last one is uh, three scriptures that challenge this last doctrine of grace in the eyes of a Calvinist, perseverance of the saints. And so the Calvinists think that no matter what happens, the, the saints are going to persevere to the end. And the first scripture that challenges that is found in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 2 where it says, By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. Very clear, right? It's like in your face. Uh, By this gospel you are saved. He's talking to believers. All right? People that have already received Christ, they've believed. By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. So like, so like, how, how is that? that? That that challenges a Calvinist view of what the the perseverance of the saints. It's like, you, yeah, you you can persevere. God will never take salvation from you. He gives it to you. It's I believe in I believe in the perseverance of the saints. And like I said, I believe I, be, I actually believe in all these doctrines in a certain perspective, but not in the perspective that a Calvinist believes in them. So, but I believe in the, I believe I'm going to persevere. I understand. Uh, I understand. Like ba- balance, uh, right, the word says to rightly divide the word of truth. Okay, so that's the first scripture. The second scripture that scriptures rather, it's a, it's a number of them that challenge this is found in Galatians five one through four. And before I read these, I'm going to just set a little groundwork in that the Galatians were a body of believers. I, I believe it was mostly Gentiles. It was a mix, Gentiles and Jews. In uh, in they, uh, because Paul is the is the uh, the apostle to the Gentiles. He was the Jews rejected him. He still got a lot of Jews saved, but mo- most of them rejected him. And he went to the Gentiles, and and he established churches everywhere he went. And so, and so the Gen- the, the Galatians were were they were seeing a lot of miracles. They understood. They got saved. They were seeing lots of miracles happening. And then they were being deceived by Jews that were infiltrating their ranks and. And trying to convince them that they need to be circumcised 
And so the Galatians, a lot of them were being tricked by this. And so it says here, Galatians 5, 1 through 4, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Mark my words, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. So there you go. Uh, stand firm then. Do not let. So this language, it shows a responsibility on the part of the believer. Continue believing what you believe at the first. He's not talking to unbelievers. He's talking to believers here. Stand firm. Do not let yourself be circumcised. If you're going to go back to the Lord, you've fallen away from grace. So like, it's like that so clearly challenges the perseverance of the saints. Okay, so... Uh, all right, now the last scripture is found in Hebrews. The last scripture that I'm going to read from in challenges that doctrine of grace, the perseverance of the saints, that it's the way the Calvinists believe it. Hebrews 10, 26 and 27. This is pretty well known. I've used this to challenge a lot of, make a lot of different, different arguments about the way people believe. Uh, if we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. So here we go. Very clear. It's like a lot of these scriptures I don't even really need to elaborate on because it's just right there in the context of what it's saying. So you can... You can go back. You're capable. You have a free will. You're capable of going back to your old ways, to the muck and mire, to the vomit, to the to the mud, and uh, and it's there's no more sacrifice. It, you, so forget it. You're, you're you're turning away from the only truth that's going to get you saved. So the perseverance of the saints on that can not with that scripture. Yes, there is perseverance with the saints. So I'm going to make it. I believe I'm going to make it. Because I know the truth, and I'm going to stand firm, knowing my responsibility, knowing that the grace of God empowers me. And, and, and I don't, I'm not saying that my responsibility, uh, I'm not saying that, that with my responsibility uh, that I have as a believer, that it's on my own strength. In all of that, and all the scriptures I mentioned, it's not on my own strength. I believe it's, the, the Christianity, I've said many times that Christianity is the ministry of the Spirit. You can't do this life without the Holy Spirit. So when the Holy Spirit comes into you, He empowers you and enables you to walk out this life and to fulfill these scriptures. That's why it's important to get the scriptures in you so that the Holy Spirit can bring them to your remembrance so that He can teach you and train you and so you can walk out this life and become an overcomer. We even see in the book of Revelation how Jesus rewards people for overcoming and so that's that's what it, it's a race to the end, friends. And so I just want to uh, want to challenge you all to believe the word of God correctly. And uh, what is the purpose of this? It, it, it's if you don't, if you're not believing the word of God correctly, it it'll it'll cause you to become complacent and lazy in your faith and think that everything is peaches and cream. And this is clearly a do gospel. It's not, you don't do anything to get saved, but if you truly are saved, you're going to be doing the work of the kingdom. And that's also why we see uh, Jesus talking about the sheep and the goats, where the goats were those who claimed to believe, but yet they did nothing for the kingdom, and they were cast out. And the sheep were the ones who, who were doing what the Lord was telling them to do, and they were welcomed into heaven. And so it's a due gospel. It's the evidence when you're, when you're doing the work of the Lord, uh, it's evidence that you truly do believe. And so believe it. So that's that, that's the application of it, is that if you're believing it the wrong way, it's going to make you lazy and complacent and do nothing but a kingdom and think that you're right. You're going to be deceived. Uh, it, like the word also says, and when I say that word deceived, it brings up the scripture, uh, do not uh, uh, do not be deceived, or no, no, it's not it. Uh, uh, be a doer of the word and not just a hearer, and so deceive yourself. So those who are just hearing the word and not doing the word, They've deceived themselves. So when you hear the word, you become a doer of it. And, uh, and so that, that's, that's the reason why I do what I do. I, I want to make sure that I'm welcomed, richly welcomed 
and it's a race to the finish, it, the redemption of my body. I believe I'm saved now, but it's, it's, it's completed at the redemption of my body when I've gone through this race completely. And so, uh, God bless you guys. Thanks for, for watching. Thanks for all the comments. I do read all the comments, but I get a lot of people asking me for prayer, and, and I can't. It's just too much to answer all of them. And I also don't answer a lot of them because because there's redundancy there where th these questions are answered in other teaching videos I've made and other in other healing videos. And so so you just need to watch more of the videos I've made. And, and and I would also challenge you to make sure you don't have too many teachers in your life because too many teachers in your life breeds confusion. So you want to just have a you want to have the word of God, the Holy Spirit is your teacher. And then you can choose one or two other believers in the faith and learn from them and stick with them, uh, depending on what it is you're led, ha whoever you're led to. But just don't have too many, because like I said, that's what breeds confusion. And then you're like, well, what's right? What's right? Because you're going to, when you have a lot of teachers, you're going to hear a lot of different, different opinions. And so, but anyway, God bless you. Thanks for watching. And I, I hope and pray that this is effective. For people and so yes lord well, i thank you for this opportunity and bless those who have watched this and uh, bless it to their heart the truth that has been brought forward may it have an effect and it will have an effect your word does not return void so i believe that people are going to grow in the knowledge of the truth from this in jesus name amen